So by now, you all know that I'm really into mesh networking systems. I've reviewed a whole bunch of different systems, and during those reviews, I sometimes have to use some technical jargon to talk about some of the features, and that can be pretty intimidating for consumers. And this technology is expensive, so to get the most out of these devices, I think it's really important that you have at least a basic understanding of what some of these terms mean. So this week I present to you the Technically Speaking Wi-Fi Lexicon Volume 1. All right, question for you. What do you call this thing? That device you got from your internet service provider, it's not called a modem or a router, it's called a residential gateway. It also functions as a router and a modem and sometimes a switch. Now, no one's gonna correct you if you call it a modem or whatever, but it's important to know the term residential gateway to avoid confusion, so that when nerds like me say Google Wi-Fi is a router replacement, you understand that you still need the little box from your ISP, just not all of its features. Now, this is what most people would call a wireless router. Like a residential gateway, it is also a multifunction device. It is a router, and it is also a wireless access point that's built right into it. And these antenna broadcast that wireless signal kind of like a radio station. Also like radio stations, these devices have limited range and have problems penetrating thick obstacles like walls. So to get the most out of these devices, you should place them in the middle of your home, out in the open and away from any walls. And now you're probably thinking about your house and how that advice just isn't gonna work. So you're gonna put it in the corner of the house, down inside a little cabinet so that it's out of the way. If that sounds like you, I'm also gonna guess that your wireless internet is really, really slow when you're connected to it and the signal is crap and it doesn't even cover your entire home. How, how am I doing? Four out of four, right? An early way of fixing limited network range was to use a wireless repeater, which does exactly what the name implies. It sits within range of your wireless network and repeats or rebroadcasts that wireless signal. And oh yeah, it was barely usable. For example, you had to manually toggle between connecting to your wireless network and the repeater if you were within range of both. Now, slightly more advanced are Wi-Fi range extenders, which get the job done, but not without their own set of drawbacks that have since been addressed by the rise of residential mesh networking. A mesh network takes the idea of wireless networking and range extenders and scales that up through the use of more hardware and clever software tricks. If one router is good, then more routers is more good, right? Mesh networking systems have multiple devices that work together to create one giant wireless network that's usually controlled by a smartphone app. There's a lot of improvements to how a mesh system manages and communicates to wireless clients like your phone, but only if that device supports it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about protocols and software. Industry standards are the reason why you can go into pretty much any store and buy a pair of headphones and know with confidence that it's gonna work with your device. <sighs> Boy, that's a dated reference now. The same is true with wireless networking, which has evolved significantly from when it was first introduced. And the body that's in charge of governing those standards is called the IEEE, or Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Now, among the ridiculous number of standards that they've defined over the years is IEEE 802, which defines standards for local area networks. Now, that standard is then further divided into subcategories that cover specific methods of communicating, such as 802.3, which governs Ethernet, and 802.11, which is wireless networking. Some of the first commercially available devices that supported wireless networking were covered under the 802.11a standard. And that standard continues to evolve, too. Since then, 802.11b, g, n, and a, c have all come out that support more wireless clients, higher networking speeds, and utilize different frequencies to help avoid signal interference. And now my wife is calling. What do you want to do for dinner? I decided last night, your turn. Okay, but what do you want to do for dinner? And that standard continues to evolve too. 802.11ax is right around the corner with AY following shortly next year and AZ due sometime out in 2021. Eventually somebody in marketing got a hold of the Wi-Fi nerds and told them that their naming convention sucks. Now when you buy a wireless device, you'll likely see this type of icon, which was introduced by the Wi-Fi Alliance in 2018. Products that support 802.11n, the fourth version of the Wi-Fi standard, will now be labeled with Wi-Fi 4. Products that support 802.11ac will be labeled Wi-Fi 5, and then the upcoming AX will be marketed as Wi-Fi 6. I know, seriously, why did it take this long for them to figure out that their naming convention is terrible? I, I don't know. Okay, let's go back to our radio analogy for just a second. If you still listen to the radio, chances are you listen to an FM radio station. You could still listen to an AM station, but the sound quality is terrible. 
That being said, there's still some significant advantages that AM has over FM. Like AM FM radio, Wi-Fi also has two different bands that it communicates on, the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequencies, both of which have their own strengths and weaknesses. Early Wi-Fi devices utilized 2.4 gigahertz for wireless communication, which is the slowest of the two and also able to penetrate walls more easily, but is the most susceptible to interference like microwaves or cordless phones. Newer systems also use a 5 gigahertz frequency, which is over twice as fast than the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, but is easily blocked by furniture or walls or any other obstacles in the way. Now, routers that support both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz in the same package are called dual band routers. Now on the market, we're starting to see things like tri-band routers, but tri-band is a little misleading. See, we're not coming up with a whole new frequency like 10 gigahertz for wireless communication. Instead, tri-band refers to having an additional 5 gigahertz band available. So three total bands on it, three tri, you, you see what they're doing there? For mesh systems, tri-band is a really nice feature because it allows you to segregate all of the administrative background traffic used to coordinate communication between all of your mesh endpoints, also called a wireless backhaul, onto its own separate channel, which means that's more bandwidth for you and your clients. Another huge advantage of mesh systems over the older extender system is band steering, or sometimes called concurrent operation. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video with extenders, they create additional networks that you have to swap back and forth between, which is pretty annoying to say the least. A network that supports band steering means you only ever have to join one network. There's not two networks, one for the 2.4 gigahertz and one for the five gigahertz. There's only one network to join and then the system itself kind of intelligently determines which network is best suited for your device and then steers you to that band accordingly. This is one of those like small quality of life improvements that if you ever have it and then go to a router that doesn't have it, you will notice it immediately. UPnP or Universal Plug and Play is a system that lets devices behind your router open up very specific communication links to servers on the internet. A very common example of why this is important is this guy right here. Modern consoles that connect to the internet all require very specific ports to be opened up in your firewall so that your console can reach that gaming service. Now UPnP massively simplifies this by allowing the device to automatically request those ports to be opened for it. This is a huge time saver and not to mention a headache saver if you've ever had to deal with firewall rules, but that's not a perfect solution either. There's some really significant security problems with UPnP for those that actually care. All right, finally, let's go through a quick thought exercise real quick. By now, pretty much everybody knows what an IP address is, right? It's four sets of numbers separated by a dot and the value of each number ranges between zero and 255. Now with a little bit of math, we can calculate the total number possible IP addresses that are out there. That's about 4.3 billion possible IP addresses. Now head over to Google and just type in whatever current year it is when you're watching this, how many devices are connected to the internet. As of 2018, when I'm recording this video, that number is somewhere north of 11 billion devices. So if there's only 4.3 billion possible IP addresses and 11 billion devices, What's going on here? That little bit of black magic is called NAT, or Network Address Translation. And it's because of this clever little trick that we will never, ever, ever have to worry about IP addresses ever for the rest of human history. Mark my words. In the early days of the internet, if you had a device that wanted to communicate on the internet, you had to have a unique, routable, external IP address. But thanks to NAT, only your residential gateway needs that unique external IP address. Your devices then get some type of non-routable private IP address like 192.168.something.something, and then your residential gateway takes care of translating requests between the external internet and your internal network. This means you can have a network with hundreds or even thousands of clients on it that all interface via a single public address. That's a massive savings of IP addresses, which is how the internet largely exists today. Without NAT, more than half the internet would disappear overnight. Now, double NAT occurs when you add a second router behind your main router. You're NATing twice, double NAT. You get the, you get the math? Now, generally speaking, you should avoid double NAT, and if you're doing any type of online gaming, that's pretty much a hard and fast requirement. For everyone else, unless you absolutely have to, the process of fixing double NAT can be fairly complex, so don't do it unless you have to. 
All right, that's gonna do it for me for today. I appreciate all of you stopping by to check out this video. Did I forget anything? Is there any term that you're dying to know the definition for, or you wanna expand this for maybe the technically speaking Wi-Fi lexicon volume two? If so, leave a comment down below. We'll be checking on them and I will see you all next time.